My name is Nathan Wiens. Today I'll be talking about distributed layer three roaming with Meraki. So first, why do we need layer three roaming? Well, roaming was basically developed to move uh, layer two client from one access point or one BSS ID to another. So within a layer two domain, if clients are moving from one to the other, it's fairly seamless. That handoff happens pretty quickly uh, and traffic continues to pass without the client really noticing or the user noticing um, that they have moved from one access point to another. The problem is with layer three, we've moved to a new uh, IP subnet or a new VLAN. Uh, and in order to pass traffic, we need a proper IP address that lives um, in that VLAN or in that subnet. So if I move from VLAN 81 in this diagram to VLAN 82 over on the right hand side, which has a different subnet, that traffic is going to be black holed until my client gets an IP address in that correct subnet. Problem is most clients assume that when they roam from one access point to another, uh, they stay in the same layer two domain. And so they'll continue attempting to transmit using their existing IP address from that original subnet. Um, that access point subsequently will drop that traffic because it's an invalid IP address. So it's now up to the client to detect that uh, it's moved to new layer three domain, send out a new DHCP request to get a new address. And depending on the client that can take anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes. So for a client that's doing latency sensitive applications like voice or video, this becomes extremely problematic uh, and frustrating for the user when they're moving from one layer three domain to another. Now distributed layer three roaming uh, is different than typical layer three roaming, which uses a centralized data plane or a centralized concentrator, which all clients uh, in that SSID are tunneled up to. And then that traffic is egressed from that concentrator uh, from that single point. The problem with that is it becomes a bit of a scaling issue as the number of clients grows, that concentrator also needs to be able to deal with the capacity of tunneling all of those client sessions and all of that traffic up to a single appliance. Distributed layer through roaming takes a bit of a different approach where when a client first associates, it's gonna get an IP address um, in the VLAN where that first access point lives. And the access point is um, gonna maintain a client database, which has all the clients in the entire network along with their IP address, their MAC address, their VLAN, and the DHCP lease time. The least time is important because that basically says how long is that IP address valid and that's how long that they will keep that client in that database. So when a client associates, the first thing the client that access point does is check the client database to see if there's already an entry for that client. If there is not, it's going to create a new entry and it's going to distribute that entry to all access points that are within that network, regardless of which VLAN those access points are a member of. So now every access point has a set, uh, common database that has every client um, across the service set. And it assigns that first access point as an anchor in case a layer three roam happens and also identifies two other candidate APs in the same VLAN and subnet to potentially be used to tunnel to. And this is important for load balancing to make sure that we're not gonna be tunneling a ton of clients to the same access point and overloading that. You can see what this looks like from a packet capture here. So my uh, two access points are 10.8.1.2 in VLAN 81 and 10.8.2.2 in VLAN 82. Um, and as soon as that client associates, you're gonna see some traffic. It's encrypted UDP traffic that happens between those access points, but we're forwarding that client entry uh, off to that second access point. Now, when a client moves between access points in the same VLAN or same uh, subnet, it's just gonna do a layer two roam uh, like it's always done. But once the uh, client moves to an access point that's in a different VLAN or a different subnet, that access point again is gonna check its client table. It's gonna see that it has an entry for that client with an IP address, um, VLAN, and an anchor AP that's uh, that's in a different subnet or VLAN. And it's gonna establish a tunnel automatically either to the primary anchor or to one of the candidate APs. That tunnel gets formed automatically as soon as that roam begins and the client's traffic will be sent to the new access point 
but then tunneled over the wired network to the original access point. And then that traffic will egress out that access point into that original VLAN and subnet out to uh, the wired network or wherever it needs to go. Now that tunnel will be established as that client roams to different APs in the new service set. Um, it will be tunneled back to uh, the original access point or the anchor access point as long as that session stays up and does not disassociate for more than 30 seconds. If it does disassociate for more than 30 seconds, we assume that that device has gone to sleep or it's doing a longer roam. Maybe I've powered it off or I've manually disassociated from uh, the access point. And in that case, a fast roam or a seamless layer two type roam is no longer needed. And so we can remove um, that tunnel. And then if that client does reassociate, it's gonna get a new anchor um, and a new uh, client entry in the database um, once it initially associates. We do keep that client information in the database until the DHCP lease is expired. And you can see here, so that client has moved from access point one to access point two in VLAN 82. And you can see these longer frames that are being sent back from the new access point back to the old access point, which is tunneling that user data. Again, it's encrypted UDP traffic um, that gets sent between those access points. So in summary, this is a lot more scalable than having a centralized controller, right? We can central, or scale this up to uh, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of clients and having those candidate APs allows us to load balance those tunnels back. And then for the majority of clients who should be for the most part living within their layer two domain, we're not doing any type of tunneling or anchoring at all, um, which makes the process a lot more seamless, a lot fewer tunnels have to be built and a lot less traffic is going to be tunneled across my wired network unnecessarily. Uh, supports common features like radius, radius COA, URL redirect, all those kinds of things are going to egress from the new access point back up to the radius server as needed. Also works with features in the Meraki dashboard like group policies and dynamic VLAN mappings, uh, which can be configured in the Meraki dashboard. All right. Now I'm looking at the Meraki dashboard and I can see uh, my access points that are in my existing network here. To configure distributed layer three roaming, we're gonna go over to the wireless tab and then the access control page. From this page, I'll pick the SSID that I wanna enable this for. You can see I've already configured WPA2 Enterprise with a radius server. Um, in this case, I'm using Cisco Identity Services Engine but the important configuration is gonna come down to the addressing and traffic page here. You can see I'm currently using bridge mode to enable a distributed layer through roaming. All I'm gonna do is click on the layer through roaming button. We'll make sure that we're enabling VLAN tagging on this SSID and we're gonna hit save changes. And that's it. The rest of uh, the process is handled automatically by those APs as soon as we turn on distributed layer through roaming, it's gonna start maintaining that client database automatically for you. Thanks for watching and I hope this was insightful and useful.